Baba gimene bika Jesu Kristu niyakutrelo uhamba na bala na lava bantwana ukufunda gashe ngezinto zaku. Father, I pray that you filled Amy with your Holy Spirit and me also, Lord, that we would both to these two different groups um, preach what you want in a way that pleases you and a way that these children and these us older children need to hear. Lord, may we not just preach to others, but preach to ourselves. And Lord, may you have your way with us. And Lord, I pray that for those who don't know you, from the children and from us, Lord, that these things would so remain in our hearts that at the right time we would commit or people would commit their lives to you and experience new life and to be born again. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, as I said before, Happy New Year. Um, <laughs> um, Jewish people around the world regard um, this time of year as the New Year in their civil calendar. And... Um, but biblically, it's not called the New Year. It's called the Feast of Trumpets. In Hebrew, Yom, ha, um, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Blowing Trumpets. And it's in Scripture. And I think the fact that it's alien to us, or some of us at least, indicates that you know we've been estranged from the Jewish roots of Scripture. And why is that important? Because it's important because Jesus came as a Jew to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, he fulfills the significance of everything, well, let's put it this way, everything that God gave to Israel that speaks of his first coming, and he's going to fulfill the significance of everything he gave to Israel regarding his second coming. That this feast actually is so significant that um, if we don't pay heed to this, it could jeopardize the message of this. It could jeopardize our standing with the Lord when he returns. Because really, it's about the return of Jesus. Now, Jewish people all over the world celebrate this feast over two days. So it started on Friday evening from sundown, and they extended an extra day. So Jewish days don't begin midnight they begin sundown because in genesis 1 it says there was evening and there was morning one day so the in the jewish calendar the the, the religious calendar it always starts from sundown to the following sundown and that was the same when jesus lived on the earth he celebrated these feasts from sundown to sundown the reason why they celebrate it over two days is because this is the only feast in the calendar that occurs on a new moon. So you would have noticed that it was pretty dark on Friday night because it's a new moon, it's the new month. The Hebrew calendar, each month goes according to the moon. So it starts, it traditionally, before they set their calendar, it always started when they could observe the new moon. So if there were clouds in place, or if there were not enough witnesses to see that new moon, that crescent, new crescent moon, then they would start it the following day. And that's why they celebrated over two days. Why is it important to note that this observance of two days for the Feast of Trumpets is very ancient? It's before they set the calendar like 30 days exactly. Um, it was when they observed it, especially at the time of the temple, they would have people stationed to watch for the new moon. The Feast of Trumpets is one of four New Years that Jewish people have. 
You probably didn't realize that Jewish people have four New Years. Now, they make this one the big one, but scripturally, it's not the big one. The big one is in Exodus 12, verse 2. Exodus 12, verse 2. This is around about March, April, and it's the start biblically of the month of Aviv, or it later came to be known as the month of Nisan, nothing to do with the motor cars. <laughs> it was the Babylonian name for this month. And it says, and so this is the month of Aviv, or the month of Nisan, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. So God is actually saying the first month is the month around about March, April. That new moon then is the beginning of the year. But Jewish people regard that as the beginning of the year for festivals. So you'll see straight after this, in chapter 12, they have the celebration of the first two feasts. The Passover, the Pesach, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They, they occur at the same time. That's the first in the year of feasts. So this new year right now, they regard that as the new year of sabbatical years and jubilees. And you might not know anything about sabbatical years, but scripturally, God told Israel every seventh year in the land, they had to not farm the ground. They had to leave it alone to rest, and they would harvest that which grew by itself. And if you think about that, that might feel a little bit risky. But God wanted his land to have a rest. Doesn't that sound familiar? Every seventh day, he wanted his people to have a rest. So every seventh year, the land had to have a rest. And every seven times seven years, every 49th year, when you get to that 50th, 50th year, you have a year of jubilee. Which means that if you owe anything to anybody, it is really a great reset. All debts are cancelled. So if you think you've gotten, you've gotten this huge debt and you've been trying to pay it off, you get to that year, you're free. And the land that you had to sell in order to pay off your debts that belonged to your family, historically, that land goes back to your family. It's, it, everything gets reset everyone becomes free, everyone comes into rest. And that is speaking about Jesus' return. When Jesus comes back, this world is trying to do a great reset at the moment, and it's not going to work. The only great reset that's going to work is the one that Jesus will bring. He will cancel everything, and everybody will receive what they're going to receive, depending on how they responded to his gospel. Jewish people who are alive when Jesus comes back and cry out to salvation will be saved, but those who fight against the Lord will be destroyed and everything will be new. Everything will be renewed, even the land. The land's going to be renewed. It's going to become fruitful. People are going to take their weapons of warfare and they're going to turn them into farming implements. So says the word of God. And so if we're looking to create a great reset here and now, it's not going to work. It's only going to work when Jesus comes back. And so the peace that we're looking for is the peace that is brought by the Prince of Peace. So this part of the year, which is the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, this month that we're in now, Tishri, is the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Why am I emphasizing the number seven here? because it speaks of perfection and completion. This is not just a human, this is not a human invention where they thought, oh, seven months sounds good. This is by God's design. God gave this to his people, Israel. And though we're not under the law and there's no compulsion for us to observe any of this, I think we rob ourselves greatly by not looking into it, by not learning it, by not taking these things to heart. You'll be interested to know that there's two other new month, new, new year, and the first is in a month called Elul, which was the last month of the Jewish calendar. So it's about August, 
And that's a new year for the tithing of animals because they believed that well, they, they, what they experienced was the animals were giving birth at this time. So if you think about it, we have several new years. We have the new year of the 1st of January, but you also have a new year of tax, don't we? We have the tax year, which starts, I think, April and ends at the end of March, or how is it here? Is it different for different people? I think in New Zealand, end of April, no, end of March, beginning of April is the new tax year. So here is the end of Feb, beginning of March. So that's the new year for tax. For most people, not everybody, obviously, but for many people. So they had to tithe, they had to give 10% of everything that grew organically. They never tithed money. When Jesus was alive, there was no tithe of money. So we don't preach tithing in this church. We preach free will giving. But they tithed animals and crops. So if your animals are giving birth around Elul, then that's the new year for tithing animals. But the trees are producing their fruit about January. And so they call that the new year for trees. Um, they call it Tu Bishvat. And so um, that month, so there's those four, four new years. Let's look at this time of year. Let's look at the Feast of Trumpets. Can we turn to Leviticus chapter 23? Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 23 to 25. Again, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a memorial by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall bring an offering by fire near to Yahweh. So this day, in, in the biblical time, it could fall on that day, which we call the first of Tishri, or it could actually fall on the following day, depending on when they saw the new moon. Today they do both days. And you'll see here... Sorry, sorry. I don't know, but I know they were blowing trump. They blew tr for seven days. They were silent. On the seventh day, they blew. Yeah, but theologically, it is the there's the same message there. So you'll see it matches with um, the Jericho. It matches the Book of Revelation and the trumpets that are blown there. Theologically, there's the same message behind it. But here it says. You firstly have a rest. You're not to do any laborious work. So this is a holiday. In fact, they call it, um, they'll say happy holidays in Hebrew. They say Chag Sameach, which means happy feast. Their holidays were religious feasts. They weren't just to go to Barbados and have a nice time. It was to come to God's presence and to celebrate and with joy the things of the Lord. But the certain feast they're not very joyful. This one is not that joyful. It is a little bit solemn, and it's heading up for the most solemn day of the year, the Day of Atonement, which we'll look at just now. They had to blow the trumpet all day, and you'll see it's this kind of trumpet. There were two types of trumpet in, in, um, in Jewish history. They had built two silver trumpets, and these were spoken of in Numbers 10, verses 1 to 10. Numbers 10, verses 1 to 10. While you're turning there, this is not exactly the kind of horn that was used for the Feast of Trumpets. They used a ram's horn. A ram's horn but it's from an animal. And this is called a shofar, a shofar. These trumpets in Numbers 10 are different. They're called chatzotra or chatzotrot for more than one. Chatzotra is one, chatzotrot is more than one. And these are silver trumpets. 
And so Yahweh, in verse 1, spoke further to Moses, saying, Make for yourself, or make yourself, two trumpets of silver. This is not shofar, this is chatotra. Of hammered work you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camp set out. So both will be blown, and all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of tent of meeting. Yet if only one is blown, then the leaders, the heads of divisions of Israel, shall, shall assemble before you. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. And then you shall blow an alarm the second time, and the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown for them to set out. When convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. So what that means is there were different ways of blowing the trumpets. So if they were blown in a certain way, everyone knew we've got to be careful, we've got to move out, or there is danger. Other times, they blew it in a different way that made them say, oh, we've got to gather together. So they're communicating through sound, not through language, but through sound. And this is what Paul is, probably what Paul was rela relating to. If the sound of the trumpet's indistinct, how will you know what's being blown? You have to blow a distinct sound through the trumpet, and he speaks, speaks of that concerning the gift of languages, what people call tongues. If you're just like, it's like, that's not language. Now, that's an indistinct sound, it means nothing. It's got to have distinct sound. And so here, there would be two very, at least two very distinct sounds, and a sound for alarm, and a sound just for convening an assembly. But then, also it says, um, if you go down to verse 9, when you go to war in your land against the adversary attacks you, you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. Look at what it says, that you may be remembered before Yahweh your God and be saved from your enemies. So the blowing of the trumpet was for God to remember them. And why would he remember them? Because they're obedient to do that which he says. The, the trumpet woke people up from their regular activity to realize we have to get ready for something. And as God sees his people getting ready, he remembers them. And he's saying, I will intervene and I will come and save you. Now, let's just go on. <laughs> Verse 10. It's also used for sacrifices. So also in the day of your gladness and the day of your appointed feasts, on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets of your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, and they shall be as a remembrance of you before Yahweh your God. I am Yahweh your God. So even when they were giving up the sacrifices, they were blowing these silver trumpets. On the day of, a, uh, on the day of blowing trumpets, they give sacrifices as well. And so you'll see, um, if we turn to Numbers 29, and verses 1 to 6, it says, Now in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall also have a holy convocation. That means they're called to be together. They're summoned, and they come together. Numbers 29, verses 1 to 6. You shall do no laborious work. It will be to you a day for blowing trumpets. So the whole day they're blowing trumpets. But the word for trumpet is, is to do with the, it's the shofar here, the blowing the ram's horn. And it says, And you shall offer a burnt offering as a soothing aroma to Yahweh, one bull from the herd, one ram, seven male lambs, one year old without blemish. And their grain offering, fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah for the bull, two tenths for the ram, and one tenth for each of the seven lambs. And there was also one male goat for a sin offering to make atonement. Besides the burnt offering of the new moon and its grain offering. So every new moon, every the beginning of every month, they would offer a burnt offering. And he's saying, on top of that, which you're already doing every single month, you need to give this burnt offering, sin offering, and grain offerings for the Feast of Trumpets as well. And the sin offering would be for atonement. And then you've got the drink offerings and all of those things. And it says, for a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to Yahweh. 
So he's already said, when you give your burnt offerings, you're to blow these silver trumpets. But on this day, you're to blow the shofar. So how do you do that? What you have is, you have the silver trumpets and the shofar blowing at the same time. So they'd employ an extra priest, at least, to blow this, while the regular priests are blowing those trumpets. And there are three types of blast, or sorry, four types of blast. And I'm going to try my best, but I've got a recording of it here. But they have uh, one called the tekiya, which is a long blast. And then they have three called shevarim, which are three shorter blasts. And then they have what's called teruah, which are staccato blasts, nine very short blasts. And then they have a tekiya gedola, which is a very long blast. Now, how does that, if you had to hear that, how would it make you feel? <laughs> Especially with me blowing it. <laughs> but it should make you nervous. I've actually got a recording, and this is better. That's why I've got it, because I'm not very good. Thank you. So if you listen to that, if you came and you heard that, how would it make you feel? <laughs> Amen. But also a sense of awe and a sense of seriousness. And so here's the thing that I find very, very interesting. Jewish, Jewish people, when they blow that trumpet, they're getting ready for another day, which we'll look at next week, the Day of Atonement. And they believe that on that Day of Atonement, you need forgiveness for everything. They will go up to everybody in the street and say, please forgive me, please forgive me. They don't know what they're asking to be forgiven for. They just know that I've got issues in my life that I don't even know if, I'm not even aware of them. And I need forgiveness for everything. So the sacrifices in the temple dealt with specific sins. But the fact that you're giving all these sacrifices and yet you need a Day of Atonement shows how insufficient those sacrifices are. That even they are not enough. I need to be forgiven of sins that I'm not even conscious of. And so between this day, which was Friday evening, till the Day of Atonement are 10 days. And Jewish people today call them 10 days of awe. And the whole thing, they've been throwing, blowing trumpets throughout the whole last month. And now this is the day of trumpets. And they're saying, I want my name in the book of life for another year. And so they believe, and this is, I don't believe this is biblical, but they believe by blowing these trumpets, they're confounding Satan so they can't accuse them so their names can be written in the, Lamb's book, of, in the book of life. For another year and they have more than one book of life they have several but there's one book of life for the righteous and they want their name written in there for another year and they're scared that their name will be blotted out and so this time of year becomes very 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 solemn and very important now there's a lot of jews that could take it very lightly and it's just another feast and they go up and phone all their friends and ask for forgiveness but it's supposed to be a very solemn occasion. They actually, I was told by um, Karl Mietz, who's from Israel, that there's this belief that by blowing the shofar, they're opening heaven so that God can hear their cries. And I think 
there's something wrong with that. And I shared it with her. And what's wrong is this, that they're thinking there's a problem with heaven and it's shut up. But the problem's not with heaven, the problem's here in our own heart. And the trumpet is not to do something in heaven, it's to do something with us, that we wake up and realize, I need to get right with the Lord. The, the thing that needs to be opened up is our own heart, not the heavens. The heavens have already been opened up by our Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. And so the trumpets, the shofar, this kind of trumpet, was also used in different times. If we turn quickly to Judges 3, verse 27... Judges 3, verse 27. Verse 27. And this is the time when Ehud, a uh, left-handed, which I'm glad because I'm left-handed, and Kai came in and killed the, the king of the Moabites, and he escaped. And it says in verse 27, and it happened when he had arrived that he blew the shofar in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel went down with him from the hill country, for he was in front of them. It was a call to battle, but it was also a call of victory. Because he's saying, come, let's fight. The king is dead. We can, we can win this war. And obviously, that was because God was with him. So there's a blowing the shofar. It's a sound of battle, but it's also a sound of victory in this context. And then if we turn to um, Judges 7, and um, Amy will be very glad that I'm reading this one because she's actually teaching this in, with the kids. Judges 7, verses 19 to 23. This is Gideon coming to attack um, with his 300 men. And it says, So Gideon and the, th the 100 men which were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. And when they just set up the watch, they blew the shofars and smashed the pitchers of, of, of lamps that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets, the shofars, um, and broke the pitchers and they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing and called out a sword for Yahweh and for Gideon and each stood in his place around the camp then all the camp ran and they made a loud shout and fled so they blew 300 shofarot 300 trumpets and Yahweh set the sword of one against another even throughout the whole camp they didn't even have to take you know they got a lamp and they've got a, a trumpet. Where's the sword? With the enemy. They didn't have to wield the sword. The enemy turned on each other because of the confusion. Isn't that amazing? And so it says that Yahweh set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole camp, and the camp fled as far as Beit Shita, towards Zerah, as far as the edge of Avel, Mehola by Tabat. So you've got here the trumpet used to bring confusion to the enemy, but again, it's the sound of alarm of war and of victory in this context. But it's not just to, to do with victory, it's also an alarm. We turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 to 6. So God here in the context is speaking about the judgment of enemies, not coming so that Israel will have victory this time, but that Israel will be judged unless they repent. That's basically what you're dealing with here. Chapter 33, verses 1 to 6. And so God says to Ezekiel, who's a prophet, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon a land, 
So when Babylon comes against Israel or the, the kingdom of Judah, God is saying, I am bringing this enemy against you. When I bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. So the watchman would be picked by the people and he'd be on the stationed on the walls of the city to look for enemies coming. And when he saw the enemy coming, he was to take up, actually here, the shofar and to blow it with a certain sound that's very distinct that the people would know judgment's coming or the enemy is coming. We need to be ready. We need to fight. So that's the picture. God is using a picture that they all knew. They chose a watchman. They set him up and the watchman had a job to warn the people. And it says... In verse 4, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. In other words, the people set that guy up on the walls. If he blew the trumpet, he did his job. So when the enemy came and the people were not ready, it's their fault. It is only their fault because you were warned. And so he says, in verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have escaped with his life. And so he says in verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity. In other words, it's not... If you don't blow the trumpet, watchman, it's not like God's going to stop the army coming. The army will still come. That person will be taken away into captivity or will be killed with the sword. It still will happen. He'll be taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hands. In other words, everybody is responsible. You can't say, well, um, it's not my fault. I didn't hear the trumpet blown. You're still responsible, but the watchman is doubly responsible because he's responsible for himself and for the people in the city. And so this is the people setting up the watchman, a very literal watchman who had a very literal trumpet. Now God then flips that in verse 7 and speaks to Ezekiel. So verses 1 to 6 is really a parable. What is the significance of the parable? Verse 7. Now, as for you, son of man, I have given you as a watchman for the house of Israel. So now, with Ezekiel, the people are not choosing Ezekiel. God himself has picked Ezekiel to be the watchman. And Ezekiel's not sitting or standing on the walls of the city watching out. He is attentive to hear the word of the Lord. So when the watchman sees in the wall, sees the army coming, he blows the trumpet. Ezekiel doesn't see any army coming with his eyes, but he sees the army coming before he sees the army coming. Why? Because God tells him the army is coming. So God gives way more warning than a literal watchman will give, because the literal watchman can only give a warning when the army's on the horizon. Ezekiel could give the warning before the army even gets to the horizon. I want us to pay attention to this because this is actually about us as well. And so it says, So you will hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But as for you, if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your life. So, which shofar is Ezekiel blowing? It's not this 
It is the word of the Lord that comes forth from the mouth. So as much as we hear, that is just the same as someone coming up saying, repent, judgment is coming, get your life right. It's the trumpet, it's the shofar. And here, God is saying to Ezekiel, I have set you, not the people, me. You are a prophet and I've made you a prophet. And you're just the same as the person with the shofar. So you better blow the shofar by opening your mouth and saying the words that I have for you to say. Because the enemy is coming. And so when we come back to the, this whole thing of the Feast of Trumpets, what does it mean for us? I'm not a prophet, and I don't think any of you are, unless the Lord has kind of stored it up for the future. I don't think any of us are particularly a prophet. But the God has given the church a job to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. And so when we preach the gospel, the gospel means good news. But what is the good news that we're preaching? It is not the idea that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That is not the gospel. The gospel is that our sins have made a separation between us and God and that we deserve judgment and judgment is coming but Christ has made a way and this is the good news, he's paid the price for our sins on the cross. And now God, in light of what Christ has done, is calling everybody everywhere to repent because a day of darkness is coming. This Feast of Trumpets is the only feast that happens on a new moon. And on a new moon, it gets very dark. But when the moon is full, a lot of these feasts actually happen when the moon is full. There's a lot of light. When the moon is full, you don't need a street lamp to find your way through. But on a new moon, it's a time of darkness and stumbling. And so let's quickly look at that before we come to conclude. There's two, two areas I want to look at. First is what the Bible says about the day of the Lord. So let's turn to Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. Find it's Hosea, Joel, Amos, after the, the major prophets. Amos chapter 5 and verses 18 to 20. Woe you who are longing for the day of Yahweh. For what purpose will the day of Yahweh be to you? It will be darkness and not light. As when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him. In other words, you got away from one danger and another meet danger encounters you. Or when you go home, you lean your hand against the wall and a snake bites him. In other words, there's no escape. It doesn't, you got rid of the lion, you got rid of the bear, and you go home and you lean on the wall and the snake gets you. It's like inevitable, it, you're going to experience judgment. Will not the day of Yahweh be darkness instead of light, even thick darkness with no brightness in it? Can we go to Joel, which is just before... Just before Amos, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Make a loud shout, my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of Yahweh is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and thick darkness a day of clouds and dense gloom. As dawn is spread over the mountains, so there's a numerous and mighty people. There's never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it for the years from generation to generation. The day of the Lord is pre preceded by the blowing of trumpet. The day of the Lord is preceded by the blowing of trumpet. The blowing of the trumpet begins the day, 10 days of awe, till you get to the Day of Atonement. 
where you find out if your name's in the book of life in Jewish thought. Let's go to a few scriptures concerning what that means for us. Can we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and then chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, talks about the believers from Macedonia and Achaia, and he says, they themselves report about us what kind of an entrance we had with you, Thessalonians, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait from his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. This day of darkness and gloom is it also a day of salvation for Jesus' people. He's going to rescue us from the wrath to come. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. We don't want you to be uninformed and ignorant, brothers, about those who are asleep. That's believers in Christ who you knew who've died. We don't want you to grieve as the rest who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, that is Jesus, those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, when you die, your body goes in the ground, your spirit and your soul go to be with the Lord. When Jesus comes back, he's going to bring the souls and the spirits of those who've already gone before us. And so it says here, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, that word remain means surviving remnant, residual number. It says, until the coming of the Lord, that is the coming with the definite article. There is a day coming called the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Lord. He parousia, the coming. So we who are still alive and surviving at that time when Jesus is returning, it says, we'll, it says, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The shofar is going to be blown on that dark day, right at the beginning of the dark day, called the day of the Lord. And it says, then we, it says here, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So meaning that the souls and the spirits of those who've died and gone to be with Jesus, when Jesus comes back, he brings those souls and spirits with him, and they get united to a new body, and they will rise first. And it says, we who are alive and still remain until the coming, it says, we will be snatched up together with them. This, the word harpazo means a snatching up with force. It can mean theft, like you steal something, you snatch it. But who is going to get snatched up to meet the Lord in the air? Sorry? Partly right, those who are still here are going to be snatched up. But who else is going to be snatched up? The remnant? And who else? The, the dead who've risen from the dead. Because we're snatched up together with them. We all get snatched up to be with the Lord. There's a kind of a teaching that, oh, I hope I'm still around to see you because if I could die before the rapture happens, I'll miss the rapture. No, you're not. You are going to be raptured. Whether you're dead or alive, you are going to be raptured. Everyone gets raptured. The blessed hope is not just for some Christians. The blessing hope is for every Christian. Every Christian has the blessed hope. Whether you're being beheaded by ISIS or you're living to see the, the, the time that the Lord is actually coming back. Either way, we all have the blessed hope. And so it says, we'll be snatched up to meet with, we'll be snatched up together with them 
in the clouds. It's physical. It's not just a metaphorical. It's physical. We'll meet them. We'll be snatched up together in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. It's not just a physical, it's not just a metaphorical thing. It's a physical snatching, a physical relocation. Snatched up with force to meet him in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. Now, with that in mind, this happens at the coming of the Lord. The coming. Now, if we turn to Matthew 24, there's a very strong warning for us. Matthew 24. And it says, let's go from verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think that he will. Jesus is teaching us we should always be ready for the coming of the Lord. But I do not believe this is saying that any moment now Jesus could rapture us. He's teaching us we're to have the mindset of always being ready, but it's not saying that, and I'll tell you why. If you go back to verses 32 to verse 41, Jesus says in verse 33, when you see all of these things proceeding, recognize that he or it is near right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, which day and hour? When it is close and it is near, the day of the Lord. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So he says the same thing here as he said in verse 42 to verse 51. Now let's go back to verse 15. In, the, in that time, there's going to be a man, we call him Antichrist, that will make strong a covenant with Israel for seven years. And halfway through that agreement, he will break it. And when he breaks it, he's going to sit himself in, in the temple in Jerusalem and say, I am God, worship me. And people who know Jesus' words who are in Jerusalem and Judea will have to flee at that time. According to Revelation chapter 13, verse 6, it's not just the Jewish temple that happens in. It's also he blasphemes God's temple, that is, those who dwell in heaven. In other words, what happens in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem which is not yet built, by the way, but they've got everything to build it. The problem is if they build it, it's World War III. So when it happens, you know, sheesh, it is, this is the time, because it was impossible that they could build it. And yet when it happens, we can say to the people of the world, we told you this was going to happen. When the world would say, nah, impossible. The Lord gives us signs for a reason. And so he will sit himself in that temple and say, I am God, but he will also invade the churches as well. Do you remember um, a, a communist Russia? Well, you weren't here, but do you remember reading about it? In Romania, they gathered all the church leaders, and they said to the church leaders, we require you to put a picture of Stalin up on the walls of your churches. It's the same thing, the same principle. That's what Antichrist is going to do in the churches. He's going to require that the people worship him in their churches. It's the Jewish temple and the church. And so what he says in verse 15 is, when you see the abomination of desolation that Daniel speaks of, verse 16, then those who in Judea must flee. And then in verse 21, it says, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as not occurred since there was a nation even until that time. That means when this abomination desolation happens, after that, there's a great tribulation. 
Some people say the time before is the great tribulation. It's not true. Here it's saying then, when the abomination desolations happen, then there will be a great tribulation. This is a great persecution. And look what it says in verse 22 and 23. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. Then, verse 23, then, if anyone says to you, behold, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. So after the abomination, desolation, this, this, this fleeing, and these people in hiding, what's going to happen? People will come along and say, oh, Jesus has come back. He's in this inner room. He's in the wilderness. He says it's a trap. Don't trust them. Do not believe them. Why? Because verse 27 says, For just as the lightning comes from the east and appears even to the west, so will the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man be. They're still waiting for the parousia at this time, which suggests that the resurrection and rapture has not happened yet. Why? Because those of us who are still alive and remain until the parousia will be raptured up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. What does this teach us? It teaches us that we should be having the mindset that we know the signs, but we do not yet know the times. Jesus is saying no one knows the day or the hour. But lest we think, well, then that means I'll just wait until the signs come and then I'll get myself ready. Jesus is not teaching that either. You go to chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. You've got a parable of ten virgins. We're not going to read it. I think most of you know it. So there's ten virgins. How many of them, when the bridegroom came and they were waiting for the bridegroom to come, how many of them were ready? Five. How many fell asleep? And the five that were ready, because they had extra oil in their flesk, not just in their lamps, all ten had oil in their lamps, but five of them had extra oil in their flasks. When did they get themselves ready? Before they fell asleep. You can't turn around and say, oh, okay, there's some signs happening before Jesus returned. So I'll, yeah, I'll live my life and enjoy my life. And when I see those signs occur, then I'll get myself ready. Dangerous. If you weren't ready before you fell asleep, you won't be ready when you wake up from it. And what I believe is all of these events are imminent. They could all start happening in our lifetime at any time. And when that complex of events happens, it's so quick, you can't keep up with it. There was no time for them to get ready at that time. What does it mean for us? Well, one of the things is we could hit, get hit by a car and, and be taken out. And that's true. But I think we have to be ready for Jesus' actual return, and we have to be living in that readiness today. Because tomorrow I might fall asleep and not even realize it. I need the extra oil in my flasks today so that when Jesus actually comes, I'm ready. Do you know when you're in the army, I don't know who's, who's no one's been in the army here, but do they give you your rifle? To, you turn up on your first day, here's your rifle. You're being um, positioned in this, this part of the battle here. You go through training first. There's a, a, a special, it's not really a martial art, but it's a self-defense called Krav Maga. It's all over South Africa, but it originates with the IDF in Israel. When they train you to do self-defense, you know when they come against you, the trainer comes against you, he doesn't go soft in you, he goes hard. So if he is coming against you and he's doing the... The, 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 the self-defense for women where men are coming against them, I won't name what, what the man's going to do because the kid's here, but you get the idea. When he comes against the woman, he doesn't go easy because she's a woman. He goes in hard. Why? Because when it actually happens, or if it happens, God willing it won't, but when it happens, she is ready because she, the experience is the same as in the training. And so it should be when Jesus returns, shouldn't be a case of, oh, I need to get ready. I am ready because I was ready and lived in that readiness 
from day to day way back then. And so the question here is this, how does this Feast of Trumpets relate to us? There's going to be a trumpet when Jesus comes back that we're to be ready for. And to, we're to be ready so that we know our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So when we meet the Lord in the air, he doesn't even have to come through that list with us. Because why? Because only those whose names in the Book of Life are going to be up there. But that trumpet is not just blown on the, that future Feast of Trumpets when Jesus comes back. That Feast of Trumpets is blown whenever you open your mouth and share the gospel with somebody. Our shofar is not this horn. Our shofar is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we know what is coming and we know how dark that day is, surely that is an incentive for us to sow the seed of the gospel while we have time to do it. And I think a lot of us do take these things to heart and we think, oh, I haven't shared the gospel with that person. If they die, that person, God's going to ask me why I didn't share the gospel. I think it's a healthy thing to think because it spurs us to do that, to blow the trumpet. We shouldn't go soft on people but we need to share the gospel in a way that recognizes that we can't ever make somebody turn around. We can't manipulate somebody into the kingdom. We can't scare them into the kingdom. All we can do is warn them. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died as an expression of the love of God. Scripture says, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son it doesn't say because god had this all this love for us in the world that's why he sent his son that verse is not saying that that verse is saying by sending his son that was how god was loving the world he loved the world at that time practically he wasn't turning around and saying, i love you so much he spoke with his actions he took the punishment for our sin on the cross that we might be forgiven. You will never understand the grace of God and the love of God if you don't understand the holiness of God and the anger of God against sin. So somebody who has no concept of God's holiness or his, or his righteousness or his um, justice do not need to hear God loves you. They need to hear God is holy and you are sinful. They need to know that they've broken God's holy law. A person who's convicted of sin and says, oh, God could never love me. I am so rotten. I'm so ashamed of what I have done. Do not need to hear about the justice of God and the judgment of God. They need to hear about the love and the grace of God. Because that is exactly why Christ died. You who feel that you're not good enough for God, you are the kind of person that God wants. And you who feel, I'm pretty good, they're the kind of person that God resists. And that's the irony. The blowing of the shofar is to wake up a slumberous nation that thinks life is good or I'm trying my best and I'm a pretty good person. Judgment's coming. Get ready, wake up. And if the person responds to the grace and love of the Lord on the cross, that's another person whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so knowing the fear of the Lord and knowing the judgment that is to come, isn't that why we persuade all men everywhere to repent? Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you that um, it's not the labor of our hand, hands that can fulfill what you command us. It's not our energy and our zeal and our, and our um, hard work. It is purely, salvation is purely a gift of grace, undeserved, freely given, because the price has been paid on the cross. And Lord, at this Feast of Trumpets, we are reminded that it's not about building a, a nice life for ourselves in the here and now. 
But Lord, we're reminded that judgment is coming. And even if it doesn't come in our day, even if we die before it comes, Lord, help us to handle the shofar in such a way that we pass that on to the people that we disciple, that they blow the shofar so when the day comes that there are people that have blown the shofar and that your church will be ready. So we pray, Lord, would you blow your shofar through us? Would you blow the shofar through the evangelists of your church? Lord, if we've um, put the shofar at home and we're too busy with things in this life and not sounding the alarm, I pray that you would do such a work in our hearts that we pick that shofar up and stop blowing it again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.